All right, remember the book of Genesis, it has two major divisions. It's divided in two major parts. The first part, chapters 1 through 11, uh, deal with four major events. And the events are the creation of the physical universe, the fall of man to sin, the judgment of man with the flood, and the separation of peoples into nations. Uh, The second section of Genesis, chapters 12 through 50, deal with four major people, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. So there's four events and four people. Creation, fall, flood, nations, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Well, we've already seen God uh, in chapters 1 and 2 creating the physical universe and everything in it, including man. Uh, Last time we saw God creating woman out of man. And you remember he split man into two beings, basically, pulling a woman from Adam's side, from his side. Remember, he didn't, God didn't pull Adam or uh, Eve from Adam's head that she would be above him, and he didn't pull her out of his feet that she would be below him, but out of his side that they would be equal. And, uh, and in totality, men and women are equal. But in specific areas, God left more uh, in the man, and then in other areas, he took more out. And, and the woman has more in those areas. And so on our own, we tend to be a little bit uh, unbalanced. And, uh, and not that a person can't live a single's life. You know, in fact, Paul said it's a more excellent way, if you remember. And, and he said, if you can do it without, without burning in your lust, as Paul did, uh, that it's an excellent way. And so, and of course, our Lord, Jesus, he lived a single life, right? But for most of us, uh, in, in the areas that we are deficient, our partner makes up for that. And, and in the areas that they are deficient, you know, we've got them covered. And, uh, you know, God did this on purpose. I mean, what if, what if we were made, you know, exactly the same? Not, not the reproductive systems, but if, but if everything else was equal, our, our, our physical strength, our emotions, you know, the same brain half connections and all those different things, um, what if that was all exactly the same? We, we really wouldn't need each other like we do. You know, when, when things get tough, we, we would just bail more than we already do. Uh, you know, if you're, you're, if you're exactly the same, you and your partner, uh, what's your partner bringing to the table that you don't already have? Nothing, really. And, and you know, it, it makes me wonder if, if the women's lib push over the past 30 or 40 years has, has kind of had an effect on our divorce rate. Um, instead of embracing our differences and, and honing those skills and those abilities that God has designed us with, you know, so, so that man can bring the best manly characteristics to the, to the team and the woman can bring the, the best womanly characteristics to the team, uh, it it's kind of makes me think it's like having a really good offense and a really good defense brought together to make a really good team. You know, ex- excelling in both sides. You know, what would happen if, if, a, if a football coach made all the offensive players play uh, defense as much as they play offense and vice versa? And, and uh, what's that called when they, when they play both sides? Iron Man football. Iron Man football, that's right. <laughs> I forgot the name of that. And, uh, and that's when you're playing both sides of the ball. You don't take a break. They don't go to the sidelines. Well, why don't they do that? Why don't the professionals or the college pros do that? I mean, they could get rid of half their team. They could cut their payroll in half, right? Well, they, do. they don't because people just aren't that good. You know, they can't play both sides of the ball as good as someone that is specialized in their position. And, uh, and so the world... Or has the world, and I don't know, this may be just an observation, but has the world been pushing men, women and to be more like men and men to be more like women, uh, trying to make us the same? You know, in football, the offense and the defense are, are complete opposites. Uh, and they're both vitally important to the team. They're both of equal importance, but they're completely different. Uh, and they hone whatever skill that... that whatever the skill set that, that they are, you know, to be the best player, the best partner for the team. Uh, it seems like the, the world has been kind of uh, trying to make us the same. 
And what we're ending up with is a bunch of, of mediocre players, you know, mediocre partners. Yeah, we, we can do play both positions. You know, we can play both sides of the ball, but, but we don't excel at either. And uh, although both sides uh, on, on a, in a football, both sides are equal, but the team does have one captain, right? And, and usually I, uh, it's the quarterback, if I'm not mistaken. And, and God has made man the captain, so to speak, of the, of the family. And he's the one that's ultimately uh, responsible if the family gets on, off course. Uh, and so there's a responsibility that, that comes with that. And, uh, and the man is called first and foremost to be the spiritual leader of the family. So how is the man going to lead the team if he's not in constant communication with the coach and the offensive coordinator and, and the guy in the booth? Or is that the same guy? I don't know. But obviously I'm not a, an expert in football, but... Those of you that are, you could probably make an analogy with the head coach and the team owner and the coordinators, you know, representing like the father, son, and spirit. I don't know. Probably make a neat thing. But anyway, the, the role of the man is the spiritual leader of the family. And that means communicating with God through prayer. That means talking to the coach. That means studying the playbook, the Bible, right? That means fellowshipping with the team, your family, being there for them. And, and how are you going to lead the team uh, if you're not being led yourself? Husbands, we are called to love our wives in the same way that Jesus loved the church and gave himself up for her, it says. Jesus had the church, which is us, all believers, on the forefront of his mind uh, with everything he did. Every decision he made, every decision he still makes is in our best interest. It might not always feel like it's the best, uh, best thing at the time, but it is. It, he, it's always in our best interest. Husbands, we need to give ourselves up for our wives, for our family. They need to be the, on the forefront of our minds. Uh, not thinking about what's best for the quarterback, right? But what's best for the team? What, and what's the coach saying? What does the playbook say? You know, we're told the wife is the weaker vessel. You know, and I, and I think, think of it like she's like a, a, a fine china teacup, you know, elegant, beautiful, but, but fragile. And men, we're like the, the oversized coffee mug, you know, that's stainless steel, one that's getting kicked around on the floorboard of your truck for a couple of weeks before you bring it into the house to get washed. <laughs> and so, so women... They're the weaker vessel. They need to be protected. And, and first and foremost, that's spiritually. Spiritual protection. Husbands, if you're not the spiritual leader of the family, how are you going to protect them spiritually? Leading them, guiding them, feeding them uh, spiritually. Setting the example to follow. Not just telling them about some you know, proverbial example to follow, but, but leading by example. Living out that example. You know, as, as we're growing and maturing in the Lord, uh, we should be seeing less and less uh, of these deeds of the flesh and more and more of the fruits of the Spirit. And turn with me real quick to, to Galatians. And it's in the New Testament. If you go Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, First and Second Corinthians, and then Galatians. And you need to know where this is. Chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 19, Paul writes, Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and the things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. 
Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. In other words, who is the coach? Who are you listening to? Who is directing you? Uh, Are you directing you? You know, is your flesh with its sinful nature directing you? And, and, And then inadvertently directing your family? Or is the Holy Spirit directing you? Are you listening to him? Are you following his lead, his guidance? Uh, It's real easy to tell. You just look at the byproduct. What's being produced in your life? Which better describes you out of what we just read? Uh, Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Is your partner seeing those things in you? Are your friends, do do people see that? Or, Or do they see... Uh, immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, drunkenness, and the things like these, he says. If that's the case, if you're seeing more of those things, those works of the flesh, uh, and less of the spirit, don't, don't beat yourself up over it. Just pick up the playbook and start studying it. Start listening to the coach. Just put it behind you. So man, if you start leading spiritually, you start studying the playbook, you start listening to the coach, you start loving your wife and giving yourself up for her, just as Jesus gave himself up for us. Uh, If you do that, everything else will fall into place. It'll all fall into place. That's the foundation for everything. And as you're doing those things and living, uh, as you're reading the word and and following uh, God's guidance, everything else will just fall in. You'll start to see all of these byproducts here. Women, on your side of the ball, you're told to respect your husband's. To respect his God-given authority. To respect his leadership of the family. Uh, Which isn't too tough to do when the man is leading, just like we described, right, a minute ago. If he's he's loving you and giving himself up for you, knowing uh, that your best interest is on the forefront of his mind with with every decision that he makes and everything that he does, uh, you can respect that, can't you? Even if you know he's going to make a, a mistake here and there, you can still respect that because you know that, that, that he loves you and that he's got your back no matter what. Now, if he's not listening to the coach, uh, what, if, what if he's following uh, his own desires and, and he's not loving you and, and giving himself up for you like Jesus did for us, like he did for the church? Then it's going to be hard to respect that, that God-given authority, isn't it? It's going to be hard to to respect his leadership. It's it's going to be hard to respect the decisions that he makes. But when this is the case, does does that mean that that he's no longer the captain of the team? Does that mean that that God took away his authority uh, to lead that team? Does it mean that you're no longer required to respect him? Does that mean because he's not following his part that you don't have to follow your part? No, 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 it doesn't. We are obligated to play our part whether our partner is doing their part or not. God doesn't release us from the roles that he has called us to play, whether your partner is playing their role or not. Uh, If the offense is out there stinking it up uh, during the game, does the defense say, well, if they're not going to play hard, then then we're not going to play either? Well, no, if they do that, then they're going to lose for sure, right? When the offense is stinking, stinking it up, the defense has to play that much harder. Uh, And it is harder. And when the defense is stinking it up, the offense has to play that much harder. And it's harder. And do you know how hard it is to love someone and give yourself up for them if they don't respect you? Do you know how hard that is? I would imagine it's about as hard as respecting someone who doesn't love you. Uh, who doesn't have your best interest in mind in all that they do. They're both hard it's when, both, when, when one partner isn't playing their role. 
And God designed marriage so simple. It's so simple, yet we, with our sinful natures, we make it so difficult. Uh, so last time, we saw God creating woman. Uh, and, he, and he instituted this covenant of marriage at where, where they were, they're called to leave their parents and then the two come together to be one, working together to be one unit, one family. And so our first event in Genesis is complete. The creation is complete. Now in chapter 3, we're going to start this second major event in the book of Genesis, the fall of man to sin. And so turn with me back to Genesis We'll look, pick up chapter 3, verse 1. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field, which the Lord God has, had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. Okay, first of all, who is the serpent here? Um, we all know it's, it's Satan. Well, it doesn't say that here, but it does tell us that in Revelation uh, chapter 12, verse 9 and and uh, we don't have to turn there, but chapter 12, verse 9, and also chapter 20, verse 2, tells us that the serpent of old is none other than the devil himself, Satan, it says, who deceives the whole world. So Satan, who was formerly known as Lucifer, this angelic being, uh, is this serpent. And so why is he called the serpent or the snake here? Well, we see in other instances of the Bible that, that fallen angelic beings, or demons, we call them, uh, under certain circumstances, they can possess humans or even animals. You remember when Jesus, uh, upon the request of these demons, when he was casting them out of, of a human, uh, he allowed them to go into, into the pigs, the, the herd of swine. And... Um, and then you remember they ran off and jumped off the cliff. So apparently it wasn't as great to be in the pig as they thought. I don't know. But uh, I don't know why they uh, killed themselves. But So apparently Satan possessed the body of this serpent. And then he spoke to Eve. Now remember the reason Satan fell from heaven. It was because he wanted to be God. He wanted to be like God. And what better way to establish yourself as a God than to have God's crowning glory of creation, man, right? Uh, what better way to have that man listen and obey you over the true and living God? And uh, so, so Satan had, had said that he would be like the Most High, and now he's, he's taking this opportunity to try to, to put himself in that position, to try to get man to, to follow his will instead of God's will. So Satan... Uh, in this serpent, he speaks to Eve and he says, Indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. So Satan knew what God had said, but he's trying to turn it around. He's trying to make God look like the bad guy here. And uh, we don't know if, if Eve was just sitting here, you know, sitting there hanging out. And uh, maybe she was hungry. And maybe she's looking at this tree of the, of the knowledge of good and evil, wondering why it's different than the other trees. And, uh, and so probably Eve is hungry. I mean, that happens quite often for us, right? Several times a day. So, uh, and maybe Satan can tell that, right? She's, she's, her stomach's rumbling or whatever. And, and so he poses this question. Did God say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? And uh, Eve responds in verse 2. It says, The woman said to the serpent, from the, trees, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. Now, is that what God really said? If you turn back to Genesis 2, just go back one chapter, starting in verse 15, and let's look at that. The Lord God 
Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. Then, in verse 18, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. So when God gave this commandment, where was Eve? Well, she hadn't been created yet, right? Because God's going to make the helper afterwards. So, either God went over this again after Eve was created, or Adam passed it on to her. And, uh, and most likely it was probably Adam told her. He's the spiritual leader of the family. And notice there's a couple of changes uh, in Eve's rendition. First, the word freely was removed from eating from the trees freely. Uh, they could eat from all the trees freely, it says. You know, it's like, a, like an all, all-you-can-eat buffet. And, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe Adam was very satisfied with the shape of, of Eve's body and in an effort to keep her from putting on excessive weight, he, he dropped the freely, you know. I don't know, you know. We don't know why Adam dropped that, or, or maybe he told Eve and, and Eve dropped it. Uh, but either way, by removing part of God's word, it, it made it more restrictive, didn't it? It took away some of that generosity or some of the blessing that God had gave them when, when he said freely, like, you know, you can just take it and, and, and eat at your pleasure, at your will. Uh, when she dropped that, it kind of takes a little bit away from that restricts it slightly but then notice that there that there's a statement added to what god said uh god said not to eat from the tree but eve adds don't eat from it or touch it and again we're not sure if god had repeated himself to eve or if adam you know had passed this along if adam passed it along being the spiritual leader of the family he may have been building a little fence around the law we like to to call it that uh, building a fence around the law of God. And so Adam may have said, you know, sweetheart, God, God said we can eat from, from any of these trees in the garden. You know, now don't go hog wild, but eat from any of the trees. No. And, uh, but then he says, uh, but don't eat from the tree in the center of the garden. In fact, don't even touch it. You know, he may have just added it like that. And so now we have added to God's commandment and, and have made it more restrictive again. And, and God didn't say anything about touching it. He, he just said, do not eat from it. But you can't eat it if you don't touch it first, right? And so we do things like this all the time. Uh, the Pharisees were famous for adding rules and regulations to the law of God, like the, the Sabbath, all the specific regulations. They just built these things into it to try to keep you from breaking the law of God. And, and you know, I've, I've made rules like this uh, for myself. One of them is, is, you know, God's word says not to get drunk. And it does not say that you cannot drink alcohol. Uh, and, you know, I know a lot of people said, well, the, the wine back then didn't create, contain alcohol. Well, it would be really t difficult for the people to get drunk if it didn't contain alcohol, right? And so I don't even know why you'd have that commandment. But uh, they had to be drinking some sort of alcohol. And, and, it, and it may have been, you remember Jesus was even accused of being a drunkard. And uh, so there was something there to get you drunk. Um, now, I know back then it may have been had less alcohol in it, less content, but... In that case, you just have to consume more of it to get drunk, you know. So God's word says not to get drunk. Well, for me, I don't really like the taste of alcohol anyway. And so for me, I decided, well, I won't drink at all, you know. And then I don't have to worry about drinking too much and getting drunk. I just don't drink at all. So it's just easy. Now, if you have a history of alcoholism, you, you would definitely want to adopt a rule like that, right? Knowing uh, that, that you won't be able to stop unless you're drunk, you know, if you do start drinking. And so there's not a problem with adding a safeguard or, or a fence or a rule around the law of God. The problem is when you start calling your rule the word of God. And then you start imposing your rule upon others uh, like it's the law of God. 
And, and now Adam, he was the spiritual leader of the family. And, and if he wanted his family to not even touch the tree, you know, that would be fine. Uh, but he should have expressed it to Eve in those words. And she should have expressed it to the serpent in those words. You know, she should have said, God said not to eat from any tree uh, or we would surely die. Uh, so my husband told me not to even touch it, you know, and, and that would be fine. And what would motivate uh, Adam anyway uh, to tell Eve not to touch it? Well, he loved her, right? And he didn't want her to die. And uh, he believed what God said. And so Adam's trying to protect her because he loves her. And so Adam, if, if Adam was clearer in this explanation about God's law and his rule, you know, that, that he added on top of it about not touching the tree... If Eve would, have, Eve would have known, you know, that Adam made this rule, and we're not sure if he did or not. Adam may have, you know, made it sound like it was God's law. Uh, but if she knew it was him that added that, then not only would she be disobeying God, but she would be going against her husband, right? She'd be disrespecting his authority over her uh, by, by also taking from that fruit. And so we're not sure, again, how this was related, relayed to Eve, but... Uh, but she may have been under the impression that God said, you know, don't, that God said, don't touch it. And so here they are, you know, Satan gives this uh, statement and, and, and she kind of relays it a little differently than God had said. And then that brings us to verse four. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die for God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil. So Satan responds contrary to what God had said, and he tells Eve that she won't die. And that, and that the reason that God doesn't want her to eat from it is that she will become like God knowing good and evil. And, and you can see, well, that kind of makes sense probably in her mind. I mean, uh, God, God had called the name of that tree, the tr tree of knowledge of good and evil. So if that's what it's called. Uh, you know, and and uh, Satan's telling her this. You can see maybe maybe it's kind of making sense in, in her mind. And uh, did you notice that Satan's response, it's a mixture of the truth and a lie. It's not just a flat out bold faced lie. Uh, he intertwines his lie with the truth. First, he says that, that she will not die. And there's actually, it's sort of true from a physical standpoint because her physical body would not die immediately, but it would begin the process of dying. It would start dying. However, spiritually, she would die immediately. She would be separated from God immediately. And then Satan says uh, that her eyes will be opened and she will know good and evil. And this is true. After she eats it, she knows the difference between good and evil. However, Satan worded it like, uh, like it was a good thing to know the good and evil and, and that God was trying to hold her back from that. You know, that he was trying to, that's the way he worded it, that he was trying to keep her from something good. And uh, so, so he, uh, you know, like God made up some story that this tree is poisonous and don't eat it or you're going to die. But, but, you know, really it's going to make you turn you into a God. You know, that's what kind of Satan's alluding to. So then in verse six, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate and she gave also to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. So Eve saw that the tree was good for food. You know, she was hungry, right? Because Adam purposely left off the eat, tree, eat from the tree freely. So she's hungry. And, uh, and uh, you know, there's, there's a thousand other trees probably in there and they're all 10 feet away. But this one's right here, you know, and I'm hungry, she's thinking. And also, it was very appealing to her eyes, it says. Now, it doesn't say that this was an apple tree, you know, that we, we always portray it as an apple, but it doesn't say that. And uh, in fact, I wouldn't be surprised if it, if it really had its own kind of fruit on it. 
you know, different from the other trees just, just to avoid confusion, you know, so they're not walking by someday and, and inadvertently, you know, oh, here's an apple and pull it off and start eating it and off the wrong tree. And so I would imagine that the Lord probably had this a little distinctive from the other trees. Uh, just to be clear, he didn't want anybody accidentally uh, eating from it. And so whatever kind of fruit it was, it looked really good to her. You know, she's hungry, and man, that it looked good. You know, like if we're looking at a, a nice piece of fruit or a steak or whatever, when you're hungry and you're looking at that, it's, it looks good. And uh, so first of all, it's appealing to, to Eve's natural hunger. Secondly, it's appealing to her eyes. You know, she's, she's lusting after it with her eyes. It looks good. And, uh, you know, she probably couldn't take her eyes off of it. And, uh, you know, maybe Adam should have added, don't even look at it, you know. Don't, don't eat it, don't touch it, don't even look at it. Stay away from there, I don't know. But, uh, so not only uh, is it going to take care of this hunger, pains, but, but it, it looks absolutely delicious to her. And so it's, and then it's also going to make me wise, she think, is what Satan says. You know, it's brain food, like fish, right, without the smell. But uh, in her mind, it's like a win-win-win situation. It's perfect. You know, it's, it, it, it's gonna, I'm, I'm hungry. It's going to fill that need. It just looks delicious. It looks great. I know it's going to taste good, and, and it's going to make me wise. I mean, how can you go wrong? Uh, except... Uh, that God said not to eat it, and her husband said not to eat it. Those guys that love her said, and they don't want her to eat it. But she ate it anyway. And Adam ate it. Uh, and it says their eyes were opened. And now they knew evil. And they were ashamed of themselves, it says. You know, uh, what do people do when they're ashamed of themselves? You know, do you, do you, when you're ashamed, do you walk around with your chest puffed out and your arms spread and your head held high? And no, you don't, right? You, you kind of, when you're ashamed, you kind of cower down and your head's down and your shoulders are down and uh, your kind of arms pulled in. And you're, you're trying to hide yourself. It, it's, it's that shame made them feel their nakedness and, 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 uh, they're trying to hide. They're trying to cover that. And, and so they stitched up some leaves together to try to try to cover themselves. And really, that's a natural response to sin. It, it makes you feel dirty, so to speak, or, or unclean. And, and that uncleanness, it's exposed. It, it feels like as if everybody can see that uncleanness on you. And, and so we try to cover it up. And Adam and Eve, they made clothes for themselves, right? Well, we already wear clothes. And so we cover up our sin in other ways. You know, we, we deny it or we'll lie about it or, or we'll try to justify it. You know, we'll try to, you know, make it sound okay. Uh, and it's all in an effort to get rid of this dirty feeling, this, this, uh, this shame. If, if, you, if you didn't have that feeling, you wouldn't care, right? But uh, you have that shame, that feeling, and... and uh, and so we'll do those things. We'll deny it. We'll lie about it. We'll try to justify it. But, but none of those things work, do they? They don't get rid of the dirtiness. They don't take away that uncleanness. Uh, they just kind of cover it up. And you might be able to get by like that, but, but you know, you, you still feel that. It's still there. Well, God, he tells us to do the exact opposite of that when we sin, doesn't he? He says to admit that you sinned and to confess it. Uh, don't deny it. Don't lie about it. He says, admit it and confess it. And then he will justify us. You know, we try to justify the sin, but God says, admit it, confess it, and, and I'll make you just. I'll take care of that justice. I'll make you righteous, he says, through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And so, guys, this morning... If that's you, if you're, if you're in that position, you know, when we were reading through the, the works of the flesh, if you're seeing more of those things and, and less of this, the Spirit. Now, we're not perfect. God has made us perfect and we're righteous and in His eyes, but we're still living with this sinful nature. 
And, uh, and so there, there may be a, a hint of those things, but are you practicing? Are those the dominant things? Are the dominant things the, the, the love, joy, peace, patience? Or are the dominant things the other things? The, the immorality, the sensuality, the outbursts of anger. And uh, if that's, the, conf- if that's the, the case, then you just need to confess it to the Lord. You just need to confess it. You need to admit it to God and confess it to Him. And then He will justify you. You know, you can, you can take that list and you can say, well, you know, I'm not loving enough, I'm not doing this enough or this enough. And you can go out there and try to do those things, but that ain't going to work. Those things are a byproduct of your relationship with God. It's the outpouring of that. You don't have to worry about doing those things. You just worry about getting right with God, uh, listening to the coach, following the playbook. And when you do that, you move down the field. You, it goes good. When you're not doing that, when you're calling the plays, when you're doing it yourself, then you're going to see the outbursts of anger, the, the, uh, all those other things are the byproduct of that. And so don't get, we, we so, so often we try, okay, I'm going to do this better and this better and this better, and we're trying to do it in our, in our own flesh, our own strength, and we don't have the strength to do it. God's got the strength. He's got the resources. He's got His grace, His power uh, to do it in us. All we have to do is just come to Him, listen to Him, follow Him, listen to, to our coach, uh, and He'll do the best for us. And so if you're, if, if you're there this morning, if you need prayer, I just wanted to let you know we're available. Um, you know, we used to sit up in the front, the elders, and, and it's tough now with our setup here. Um, but we're always available, Lynn and Bob and myself. If, you just, if we're not sitting wherever, just grab us right after and just say, hey, I, wanted, I, wanted, I want some prayer. And, and we'll go find a corner or wherever, and we'll just pray, and we'll just lift you up for the Lord. All right? Well, let's pray this morning. Dear Lord, we just thank you so much uh, for being our God. And uh, we thank you, Lord, for, for providing a way to make us right with you, Lord. That you knew uh, that, that uh, you were going to need a way uh, to make us, to justify us, to make us right before you even created Adam and Eve. And Lord, we thank you for being willing uh, to give up yourself for us, Lord. And so I just ask this morning, Lord, that you would help us uh, to give ourselves up, Lord. Help us uh, to follow you. Help us to listen to your leading, to your guiding, Lord. Uh, help us to put, put away uh, our self, our sinful nature. As you said, crucify it daily, Lord. Put, uh, put that old nature in the ground. Bury it, Lord. And just help us to to uh, be focused on you, living for you, Lord, listening to you, talking to you, Lord. So be with us, Father, this week. Just watch over us, bless us, strengthen us, fill us with your spirit. Lord, give us the desire and the strength. Give us a heart for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.